Welcome to part one of Texas Folk Life's Apprenticeships in the Folk Arts Virtual Showcase. I'm Pete Breithop, the Program Coordinator for Texas Folk Life's Apprenticeships in the Folk and Traditional Arts Program. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Since 1987, uh, the Apprenticeship Program here has supported the training of hundreds of folk and traditional artists throughout the state. And since Taylor Swift's latest record, many folks have been asking, what is folklore? What are the folk and tra traditional arts? Um, and the folk and traditional arts um, you know, are art forms practiced by a community, a group of people who often share cultural values and or heritage. And these artistic traditions are typically passed on from one generation to the next or from one community member to another through extended periods of observation, demonstration, conversation, and of course, practice. Uh, this is a learning model supported by the apprenticeship program as it provides funds and resources for a period of intensive learning and exchange between outstanding master artists and apprentices. The end of the program cycle, uh, the artist teams, as we like to call them, showcase the results of the training together in public presentations. The final presentations typically take place in spaces important to the respective communities of the artist teams thus uh, encouraging the transmission um, and learning of tra traditional arts within the community. This year, however, the COVID-19 pandemic has dramatically affected the final showcase plans of each artist team as countless public arts events have been postponed or canceled. Negotiating these unexpected challenges, Texas Folk Life has worked with select artist teams from this year's cohort to present our first ever Apprenticeships in the Folk Arts Virtual Showcase. From Chinese silk and bamboo ensemble music, custom handmade boot making, to Ghanaian dance drumming, uh, we have a very exciting lineup for you tonight. And by bringing an array of folk and traditional artists from across Texas together, these virtual events um, are an opportunity not only to highlight each showcasing artist's hard work that they've completed over the course of the program, but a chance to inspire exchange and hopefully create connections between diverse artistic communities. Um, these are communities that, you know, in a non-virtual world, might not have as much of a chance to interact with one another. Uh, in this spirit, we invite and encourage you uh, to participate as well. We will reserve a couple minutes at the end of each presentation for questions, so please feel free to write any questions or comments you may have um, in the chat, in the comments thread, and we will do our best to relay them to the artists. All right, without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce our first group, the Denton-based Chinese Chamber Ensemble, led by Master Yushin Mei. Uh, a world-renowned performer, uh, Yushin is recognized as one of the most brilliant pipa players of her generation, and I will let her describe the pipa to you. Uh, and the ensemble features apprentices Mei Gao, Alex Strader, Min Xia, and Wei Ping Lu. Um, for their apprenticeship, the group focused on studying silk and bamboo ensemble repertoire associated with different regions and historical periods of China. So please welcome the Chinese, Chinese Chamber Ensemble. Thank you, Pete. Um, before I introduce my group and the music we played, uh, I would like to thanks to Texas Folk Life Organization for letting us participate in this meaningful program. And I would like also, I would like to thanks to my um, group members for all of your passion uh, for uh, introducing and learning ch traditional Chinese music in the United States. Um, so our group, the music style, uh, um, my group uh, played is called the Silk Bamboo Ensemble. It features, features um, light percussion instrument, string instrument, and blow instrument. Um, so this is a, the instrument is a called pipa. So you can see this is a four string lute instrument. Uh, it's a guitar like instrument if you're familiar with a guitar. So four strings, you can see. Yeah. So with the frets. So this instrument um, has a very long history. Uh, actually, many Chinese scholars believe that this instrument was introduced uh, from Middle East to China. Uh, the, the original instrument might be the wood. It's still very popular uh, around Middle East, that area. 
So um, pipa is, uh, as I said, pipa has a very long history. Uh, so it's a steel, uh, it's one of the re representative instruments in Chinese culture and music. So uh, uh, I would like to play um, a very short um, piece. It's called uh, White Snow in Sunny uh, Spring. It's a, uh, this piece is um, about 300 years old. But when I play this piece outside of China, uh, I remember that uh, one time in Norway, so the Norwegian young kids call it uh, um, Chinese rock and roll. So you can see, I play a little bit. The instrument is called pipa. So I would like to introduce um, Daniel Chen and the May Gao. Uh, May is a, a percussion percussionist, and Daniel Chen is, uh, he plays a uh, string instrument. It's called arhu. Uh, Daniel is our guest artist. He's also the artist director uh, of. Uh, Huayun, Dallas Huayun, Chinese ensemble. So uh, let us, uh, <laughs> let me introduce them first. Okay, Daniel and May, please. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, hi. Hi, thank you, May Laoshi. Thank you, I'm very happy to be here with you all. Thank you, my pleasure. And uh, I'm May Gao uh, and uh, keyboard and uh, percussion player at the uh, Dallas Huayun uh, Chinese musical uh, orchestra and uh, has been uh, worked in the museum for about uh, more than 20 years. And uh, let me introduce uh, this uh, Ban Gu. This is Ban Gu. It uh, has a very long uh, history. The first uh, period was uh, uh, during the Chinese Tang Dynasty, which was about uh, AD 618 to 907, and uh, has used to uh, some local uh, performances to in, uh, enhance the, the sense of the rhythm, especially for the uh, Beijing Opera Orchestra. So it is also called the uh, opera leading drum. Uh, this is a, a broad drum covered by uh, one side, I mean on the top only, uh, by a cow, cow hide. And the other side, you can see the bottom is empty, uh, made of five pieces of hard wood. And then you, you can see only uh, inside, so in the middle, there is a very, very small place that can make sounds right. Otherwise, we're totally different. So, only this small side. And uh, later on, we're gonna play together with Daniel. Now, you turn me. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Very happy to see you here today. And uh, I'm Daniel Chen, and uh, 
Uh, I'm also the member of uh, Huayun Chinese Orchestra, and uh, I'm a, a Chinese string instrument player, and uh, today I'm gonna play that uh, instrument called the Jinghu. That's uh, the main string instrument in Chinese Beijing Opera. That uh, uh, Beijing Opera was uh, popular in China for over 200 years, and it was popular from the Qing Dynasty. Qing Dynasty. And uh, the, this is called the Jinghu, two string instruments. It's a uh, main company instruments in Beijing Opera. And uh, uh, I think uh, the Beijing Opera is the most popular opera, local operas in China. So now uh, I just uh, like to, you know, introduce a one song called uh, Welcome Spring and uh, just uh, play a short piece of that song. Uh, now you need a name. Yeah, no. yeah, we, yeah. We we'll play that together. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniel and May. Um, so the next speaker will be Wei Ping Lu. Uh, he, uh, he plays Er Hu. So please, Wei Ping. Well, thank you, May, and thank you, everybody. I think uh, Daniel just introduced Er Hu a little bit. And this instrument is like the from the Tang Dynasty, about a thousand years ago, from Central Asia and to China. And this is a two string instrument. And uh, you can see, oh, there's a two strings. And there is a, uh, the bow and the horse hair. And there's two strings. And the bow is actually inside the two strings. And there's a fiddle. And you can see uh, this is a snake skin or python or something like that. Um, and there's a fiddle in there. And uh, so it's a, a solo or a small assemble instrument. And it's very popular in China. There's a lot of people play it, with it. And it's actually have a family of this. And this is a kind of a more like a uh, middle pitch and uh, like a it's called a, some somebody called it a Chinese violin 
And there's also some lower pitch and high pitch uh, variations of this. Uh, so it's a family of this. Uh, so, and this has very beautiful and a unique tune and uh, very unique. And if you hear this, you probably know this is Chinese music right away. <laughs> it's kind of a, um, a symbol of Chinese music. So let me play first a little bit of, um, more like a Western music and you probably know about it, everybody knows about it. And this, I play a little bit about this. Okay, and I hope everybody knows about this piece. And I'm gonna play a little bit more about a more like a faster piece called a horse racing. racing and play a uh, faster piece. And besides the Arhu, I'm gonna introduce another one, and uh, which is a, the Hu family. And this is a very high pitch. It's a very, uh, like a high pitch. And you can see this, this in instrument has a, like a board, like a wood board actually made from coconut, coconut shell. You see that board? And it's very high pitch. It's generally used and especially popular in the northern China. Uh, and I want to play a little bit of piece of this and call it a joy with bin. It's very uh, joyful piece of music and played most time in a, like a Chinese uh, spring festival or Chinese New Year. That's the, this piece. Okay, that's all I have today. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you, Wei Ping. Thank you so much. Uh, the, uh, okay, well, hello, everyone. Hello, Internet. Once again, like everyone else said today, uh, thank you for showing up. So my name is Alex Schrader, and this crazy cathedral of pipes is Deshaun. 
Um, these pipes are made out of bamboo, so this is going to be one of the bamboo instruments in the silk bamboo style. Everything else you've been seeing has been silk up until this point. And one of the great things about this instrument is that it's the only instrument within traditional Chinese music that can sustain chords. So if I can press down any of these little leathers like such. <laughs> Through inhaling and exhaling, I can keep a lot of chords going. And this is really good within silk bamboo music and even Chinese orchestra music because I can provide accompaniment through chords, I can do a lot of melodic stuff, and it's just all around a really useful instrument. Um, like all the other instruments you've been seeing today, uh, this has quite the varied history within uh, Chinese history. Uh, starting with the Yin Dynasty, about uh, 1401 BC, you would have very kind of crude, free reed instruments attached to um, a Winchester or a gourd back then. Just throughout the centuries, the Shang has continued evolving, throwing on more pipes, throwing on certain levers, so it makes some certain chords easier, and just to kind of fit the needs of the people. So the great thing is this is still an evolving instrument. Even nowadays, people are still putting even more pipes on there, having both uh, traditional holes that you can close as well as the newer levers that you can press down. And to kind of wrap up a showcase today, I'd like to play a little bit of music uh, to some main themes from the Dance of the Yao Tribe, and I hope you enjoy. Thank you, Texas Folk Life, and thank you guys very much for having me come through today. Thank you, Alex. Great job. Um, okay, at the end, I will um, I would like to play. Um, it's a music collaborating uh, collaboration video we made, uh, edited by our another group member. Uh, her name is Xie Mi, and unfortunately, she's uh, she cannot join uh, join us today. But uh, she edited the video for us. The music is called Horse Racing. It's an old piece composed in the 19, uh, at the end of 1960s, but uh, we rearranged it for this uh, showcase. So I hope you all uh, love it. Okay, Horse Racing.
Hi. Awesome video, guys. That was a, a wonderful performance. Um, one quick question for you that I um, want to ask. In, you know, you, you shared um, many different instruments, all with different histories, um, as well as different, you know, you all presented different pieces from different time periods and also probably, you know, from different regions uh, in China. I'm curious about how this music was transmitted um, historically and, and possibly more uh, recently. Um, you know, horses ra racing, the arrangement that you presented, um, you said that it was composed in the 1960s. So I'm assuming that might have been part of the uh, kind of the institu institutionalization of, of music in China at that time. So possibly maybe being written in staff notation. Um, so I'm just curious how, you know, maybe historically how some of this music was, was transmitted, whether through notation or orally or otherwise. Uh, actually, um, so we use uh, many, many ways, methods to transmit this kind of uh, music style or music genre. Uh, so um, before 19, 1950s, uh, it, it was transmitted uh, through, you know, oral tradition. And uh, we also used, um, it's, uh, notation is called gong che pu. It's uh, different from, uh, you know, staff notation. And it's a Chinese character. So, uh, so uh, after 1960s, uh, so many Chinese uh, musicians, they use uh, uh, numbered or um, cipher notation. Yeah, so Alex is showing us. Yeah, it's a number, yeah. So, but, um, uh, you know, since many uh, musicians got education and uh, music training uh, from uh, orchestra. So we also learned to read and, uh, you know, play uh, using uh, staff notation. So actually we use uh, both. Unfortunately, not many musicians can read Gong Che Pu, the Chinese character notation. Uh, fortunately, I I can I can read it. I can use it. <laughs> but Gong uh, Che Pu is a just kind of a skeleton. So meanwhile, it gives you more space to uh, improvise your music, mm -hmm. to create your personal style. Mm -hmm. Well, fantastic. Awesome. Um, unfortunately, we need, to, we need to move on uh, to the next showcaser. But again, thank you all for a, um, a wonderful demonstration and performance. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. That again was the Chinese Chamber Ensemble um, from Denton. Next, I would like to introduce apprentice Jeff Moore from Hazlitt, Texas. Uh, Jeff spent his apprenticeship working with master bootmaker Mike Vaughn, whose shop is based in Bowie, Texas. Uh, with clients from around the globe in a two-year-plus wait list, um, which I tried to convince Mike to move me up on, but it, that was uh, to no avail. Uh, but yeah, with a two-year-plus two wait list, Mike is truly one of the world's foremost custom bootmakers. And for his presentation today, uh, Jeff will share some of the tips and tricks he has learned from Mike as he takes us through the boot making process step by step. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks, Peter. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for, again to the Texas Folk Life Apprenticeship Program. Um, and congratulations to everybody else that's in this group as well. Y'all are doing a great job. A um, little bit about myself uh, 49 years old. I'm a career firefighter. And uh, I picked up boot making about uh, two and a half years ago. And um, it's just a lot of fun and it's uh, carrying on a, a Texas tradition that uh, Western tradition, not just Texas tradition that, um, that I'm really proud to be a part of. So um, starting off with, um, with custom boots, custom handmade boots. Um, people always ask, what's the difference in a custom handmade boot in a, in a boot that you can get off the store, uh, off the store shelf. And really there's, it boils down to two things. Um, your custom handmade boots are going to be custom fitted to your foot. We take about 10 measurements off of, a, off of our customer's feet. And, um, and we, we build the boot around those measurements. And so you get a custom fit that uh, you cannot get in a store in a store bought boot. Um, 
Secondly, um, is the quality and the design. Um, Store-bought boots uh, made by the big manufacturers. Um, they use the, you know, they make a boot as inexpensively as they can um, so that they can make the most profit they can. And in doing so, they cut back on, on the quality um, um, products that are used in the making of the boot. And then also, um, you don't get any personal style um, in a in a in a store bought boot. So, um, with a custom handmade boot, you can you can pick every single detail about the boot that you want, from the color to the type of leather. Um, so that's the the big differences in a custom handmade boot and a store bought boot. Moving down to the to the uh, to the choices of leather that we have, uh, there are a lot of types of leather um, that you can make boots out of. Some of the more common leathers that you can make uh, that we see more than some others are just regular cowhide, bullhide, um, rough out pig, which is just pig skin, but it's on the the, the rough side of it. Um, elephant is very popular. It's a very tough hide. Kangaroo is very tough, yet it's very soft. Uh, alligator, if you, um, and crocodile as well. Uh, if you want um, the classiest dress boot that there is, look no further than crocodile and, and alligator. Uh, those are the tops on the list. And then also uh, ostrich, full square full quill ostrich and um, smooth ostrich are both very, very popular leathers because again, they're very, very tough, uh, yet they're very soft and supple and there's virtually no break-in time on those. Um, if you move down to fitting the last, the last um, is that that item in the picture right there, it's a, it's a foot shaped piece of plastic, very dense, hard plastic that um, it may also be wood. Some of the older lasts are, are made of wood, but it's a, it's a rough, um, like if you wear an eight and a half, um, the last is a, is a rough eight and a half. Now this is where the, the 10 custom measurements that we come in. Um, take take effect here because we will take those measurements and measure around the last at different points and then um, we will add leather or grind off some of the plastic to get your custom fit at 10 different points on that last so whenever we build the boot around that piece of plastic around that foot shaped piece of plastic you're getting a custom fit to custom to your foot And then moving on down, preparing the insole. Um, the insole is, is shaped and tacked onto the bottom of that last. And um, these two things right here, the insole and the last, are kind of the heart and soul of the boot. Uh, the insole leather is a very tough cowhide, but it's not quite as tough as the cowhide that we use for the sole leather. So um, it's slightly soft. So when your foot sweats inside that boot, you're gonna get a custom fit to the bottom of that, in the bottom of that insole that's uh, pretty much custom to your foot. So um, the last in the insole, that's where you get the custom fit that you won't get in a store-bought boot. <clears throat> now moving down to the to the next slide, um, this is starting the um, the um, the area of the boot that you can customize to your individual style. This doesn't have anything to do with the fit of the boot. This is where all your personal style comes in. 
Um, your top leathers are usually um, kid skin, which is goat skin or, or cow hide. And sometimes we use um, kangaroo for tops as well. But uh, you can get your tops, tall tops, I mean, you know, depending on how tall you are. I'm, I'm five foot seven. So um, a 14 inch top on me would be a really tall top. But if a guy is six foot eight, a 14 inch top, may not be very tall. So you can, you can customize the height of your top. And then also uh, most importantly, the color and then the stitch, the stitch design on it. Uh, Store-bought boots, uh, they use a computer aided um, stitching computer, a uh, uh, top stitcher to stitch their design that they put on the top of their boots. We use um, a stencil with chalk and we make our own stitch designs, stitch patterns. So uh, that's something that you will not get in a hand, in a, in a store-bought boot is a custom made stitch pattern. And we all, um, in addition to just doing stitching, we can also do uh, in, um, inlays and onlays and stuff like that. So. Each boot, if you move on down to the next slide there, um, each boot is made up of two panels. There's a front panel and a back panel. And um, when we're finished with the tops, we join the, the top panel for one of the boots. We'll join it to, um, to the heel counter. And then, which is the, the heel counter is the part of the boot that goes around the back of the heel. And then for the, for the top panel, we'll join it to the vamp. The vamp is the part of the boot that your foot slides into. <clears throat> and then once we've got, uh, if you move on down to the next slide, once we've got the, the, uh, the front panel and the back panel ready to go, we'll join them at the sides, what we call the side seam we're joining the front panel and the back panel. And the interesting thing about this step of the, in the boot making process is that when we join the front panel and the back panel, the boots are actually inside out. We're sewing them, as you can see in that picture, we're sewing them together inside out. Um, so we've got to, after we, after we join the side seams, we've got to, to turn them right side out. So, um, And, you know, we've got a little special tool that we use to we get them all wet, we get the boots wet, the front panel and the back panel, and we'll turn them right side out. And then after we get through that portion of the uh, boot making process, we move on to the next slide, which is called lasting the boot. And this is where the boot starts to take shape. We put the the uh, front panel and the back panel of the boot that are now joined together and turned right side out. Now we put those over that, that plastic form, foot shaped form that's, that's got your measurements on it. And we'll stretch that, uh, we'll stretch the, the leathers over that last and, and tack them in place and stretch the leather very tight and we'll get it as straight as possible um, and then now, as you can see, that's where the boot starts to actually look like a boot. And that's called lasting the boot. And that probably is, is the most important, uh, one of the, one of the top three most important, um, steps of the boot making process, because this is where your custom fit comes in. If you don't stretch that leather and get it tacked in, in place tight enough, the boot's not going to fit properly. You want to get that, that leather tacked around that last as tight as you possibly can without, without tearing your leather, obviously. Um, but you want to get it as tight as you possibly can so that when your boots are, are completed, they're going to uh, take advantage of that custom fitted last and they're going to fit you as 
um, as 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 good as possible. So now the next step, moving down to the next slide, is called building the toe box. Um, the toe box is very important because it helps keep the shape of the toe of the boot. Most store-bought boots do not put a quality toe box in their boots, if they put a toe box in at all. Um, but this protects the integrity and the shape of the boot out all the way out to the toe, whether you have a square toe or a uh, pointed toe or even a rounded toe. Uh, it doesn't matter. Each boot gets a toe box. And uh, what the toe box is, is a piece of, um, it can be used out of lots of different materials, but we use a, a, a product called Celastic that will soak in a thinner and then put over the toe and then tack in place. We'll stretch it tight and tack it in place. Some people actually use uh, a thinner piece of leather. Some people have used uh, denim, just a cut up piece of uh, blue jeans. Uh, and then whenever we get it put in place and it dries, then we'll, we'll coat that toe box with a, a, um, a very heavy glue that dries very smooth. And we'll put, um, we'll put three different layers on that toe box, of that glue on the toe box. And it'll, by the time it's dried, it'll be um, very hard, not uh, steel toe quality hard, but um, but it'll 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 take a lot to destroy the shape of that toe. Uh, and then once we put the last um, layer of glue on it, we'll stretch the actual boot leather back over it and tack it in place again and let it dry. And then you have a very solid toe uh, on the boot. Now after we get the uh, the toe box built. Um, the top of the boot is pretty much done. Uh, we move on now to uh, the bottom work, which you'll see on the next slide. The bottom work is, cons uh, it consists of uh, forming and sewing in the shanks, which a shank is a piece of metal, or it should be a piece of metal that goes in the arch of the boot, the arch of your, uh, of your last there that gives the, uh, the boot arch support. And then we'll also sew the welt on, um, and then we'll apply the, the outsole, and then we'll build the heels. So when we sew the welt on, the next slide will show you the welt is a, um, oh, it's about a one inch wide, strip of leather that is hand sewed all the way around from the from the inside ball of the foot all the way around the toe to the outside ball uh, roughly just past the outside ball and we will sew that in place <clears throat> and then that comes in uh, that's um, that's what will actually attach the sole to the boot, one of the things that attaches the sole to the boot. So we'll sew the, uh, the welt in place. <clears throat> and then from, from sewing the welt, after we get the welt sewed in, we'll, we'll uh, sew in the shank. And then the next slide down will show this is the shank. And what we use in our shop is a 60 penny nail. Now, again, comparing this to a store-bought boot. Usually the stores, the big, the big box stores, um, the big manufacturers, they will use a fairly thin piece of plastic for their shank, uh, which does not give near the support in the, in the arch that a 60-penny <clears throat> nail will give. We'll heat our shanks, our nails, in uh, in fire, get them red hot, and then we will let them cool, and we will uh, pound them in place and bend them uh, physically, bend them to the shape of the arch. So you're getting a custom arch support as well in a custom handmade boot.
Now moving on to the next slide, uh, the next step is we'll put in uh, the outsole. Our outsoles are, um, most of the time we use leather, which is about a um, three eighths of an inch thick. So it's much thicker than the leather that you get in a store-bought boot. So it's gonna last you a lot longer. Uh, and we also use a full sole. In other words, our sole goes from the toe all the way down through the arch, all the way to the heel. So we have a one piece sole. Um, whereas a lot of the store uh, bought boots, a lot of uh, store big, the big box manufacturers will use a half sole. Um, and they just don't last. They just don't last. If you've ever bought a, um, one of the popular brands of boots that you'll see oftentimes going down the street here in Texas, um, they just don't last. But once we get the sole in place, we will tack it with lemon wood pegs. Now, the reason we use lemon wood pegs is because um, the lemon wood takes on a lot of water. So whenever we get a, um, whenever we we tack the the uh, the sole all the way around, when we put those lemon wood pegs in there, when they get wet which they will get wet in the, in the process, in the boot making process, they'll swell up. So they won't come out. That's why, um, that's why we use lemon wood pegs because they just, they won't come out once they're in. Now, after we get the, uh, the soles put on, then we'll stitch them with a sole stitcher and join them to the welt that we, that was the first part that I did in the, in the bottoming process was the welt. So you'll get, you'll get a top stitch all the way around to the welt. And then after we do that, we, um, we build the heels. The next slide down is building heels. And whenever we build our heels, we build on one layer of leather at a time. And each layer of leather on the heels is about, oh, probably, Mm, a quarter to three eighths of an inch thick. So depending on how tall you want your heel, if you want a inch and a half or inch and five eighths heel, that's usually about five layers thick on the, on the stack. Uh, if you want a two inch heel, you're going to probably get seven or eight layers of leather on your heel. And then once we get the heel shaped the way we want it, we get them all built up to the perfect height that we want. Uh, and we get it shaped the way we want, then we'll put a rubber cap on, on the heel as well. So, and the rubber cap is probably a quarter of an inch thick. So, um, once we get the, the heels built, then we move on to the final stages of the process, and that's finishing. Um, some people like to put um, a clear stain on their soles. Uh, the next uh, slide will show you um, what we use is a, is a dark stain on anything that's black. We just like uh, the, the traditional, um, you know, the dark brown uh, stain on the, on the soles and on the heels. If it's a black boot, obviously we're going to put a black stain on the soles and the heels. Um, but that finishes out the whole boot making process um, from picking out your leathers all the way through to, um, to the finishing pro process. So there you have it. Awesome, thank you, Jeff. We have a question from a Facebook viewer here. Um, there it is. There we go down there. Yeah. Danae Johnson, she's just curious, how did you go from firefighting to boot making? Just wondering, you know, what your motivation was for this shift. And if you can speak a little bit more about that. Well, I actually didn't, didn't make a shift. I'm still a firefighter. I'm a career fighter fighter. Um, I just do this uh, right now as a hobby. Um, I've worn boots my entire life. I've loved boots. Um, so I figured I'd, Last time I bought a pair of boots that actually fit me, I was probably in the seventh grade. And, um, and since then, you know, the quality of the boots um, has just gone 
down the drain. And so uh, the last pair of boots that I bought for myself um, about four years ago, I swore, you know, I'm either going to, I'm either going to, you know, I'm either going to buy custom boots from here on out or I'm, I'm just not going to wear boots anymore because they're just the quality of them. I just couldn't get a boot to fit me and they didn't last. Hmm. So um, I met up with Mike Vaughn and um, he took me on as an apprentice. And so that's how I, I got into boot making. Um, yeah, I'm still a firefighter, but um, I'll retire at some point and I'll pick up boot making as a, uh, as a second job, I guess. Awesome. We have a, a quick last minute, another last minute question here. Um, Kate Murray is wondering if you can speak about the difference between full quill and smooth. Full, yeah, that's regarding an, an ostrich skin. Um, a full quill ostrich skin, um, where the big quills of the feathers attach in the in the ostrich skin, it'll it'll leave a bump. Hmm in the skin. Uh, now part of the ostrich skin doesn't have those big feathers. And so, um, they don't have the big bumps. It's the easiest way I can describe it. So it's, it's smooth, like a, almost like a cowhide. What are some of the hardest skins to work with? Some of the toughest and what are maybe are some easier than others? Oh, most definitely. Um, some of the, um, some of the most difficult skins to work with, not really difficult, but um, the toughest skins are like your elephants uh, because they're, they're really thick, thick skin. So when it comes to, for example, stretching them over the last, mm -hmm. uh, and if, <laughs> it's really hard to, to stretch an elephant skin. <laughs> um, now, uh, the last pair of boots I made for myself were made out of uh, baby calf, and they were uh, very very thin, very supple. And it was very easy to stretch that, but that was what made it so hard was because uh, it was very easy to tear as well. So, yeah. So, oh yeah. Always negotiating and dealing with <laughs> different types yeah. of issues. Well, fantastic. Yeah. Um, wonderful presentation, Jeff. Thank you so much for, for putting it together and sharing it with everybody here. Appreciate it, Pete. Definitely. All right. We're going to, Move on, and before introducing our final artist of the evening, um, I would like to take a, a second to thank our sponsors. Uh, Texas Full Pledge Apprenticeship Program is made possible by a state partnership award from the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with the Texas Commission on the Arts um, and support from board uh, and, yeah, and, and further support from the board and members of Texas Folk Life. Further additional support is provided by the Cultural Arts Division of the City of Austin Economic Development Department. And I want to take a second to thank my predecessor here at Texas Folk Life. I just recently stepped into my position here as the Apprenticeship Program Coordinator. Um, and my predecessor was Ian Halligan. I just want to give a shout out to Ian for all of his wonderful work with the Apprenticeship Program, um, which he um, reinvigorated uh, back in 2015. So Ian worked tirelessly to really expand this program to what it is today. Uh, and Ian was the one that brought all of the current cohort, this year's current cohort, um, into the program. So Ian facilitated all of that. And I took over um, the fun, uh, during the fun stage of the program where I got to go and interview and meet all the different um, artists and learn about their work. So thank you, Ian, for all of your um, your work with the apprenticeship program in Texas Folk Life. Hope you're doing well. Um, and if you are interested in applying um, for or would like to learn uh, more information about the apprenticeship program, please contact me, uh, Pete Brighthop, at apprenticeships at texasfolklife.org or fill out the apprenticeship program interest form uh, found on the Texas Folk Life website. Look under featured articles on the homepage. And application materials for the 2021 Apprenticeship Program will be available uh, this fall. Please consider supporting the Apprenticeship Program too um, directly by making a tax-deductible donation to Texas Folk Life 
on Facebook by clicking the donate button on our page or visit texasfolklife.org um, and for more dynamic folk and traditional art programming and initiatives you can again visit texasfolklife.org and like and subscribe our social media channel okay without further ado um, apprentice shani sterling will lead the final presentation of the evening uh, dance instructor at houston community college and organizer of houston's aquaba drum and dance festival Shani's teaching and community engagement is informed by her longstanding interest in West African dance drumming traditions, particularly those from Ghana. Lucky for Shani, Texas is home to Professor Gideon Alawori, uh, a master drummer, dancer, choreographer from Ghana and professor of music at the University of North Texas. Um, in my interview with Professor Gideon and Shani, Shani uh, said, quote, Professor Gideon is a national treasure both here and in Ghana a high priest of the Yewe cult, part of the Ewe ethnic group in Ghana uh, or in West Africa, and a paramount chief in his own home region in Ghana, Professor Gideon not only teaches students in the U.S. Ghanaian dance drumming traditions informed by his long career as a globetrotting performer and educator, but he also carries out leadership and administrative duties in Ghana, traveling back multiple times every single year. Throughout her apprenticeship, um, Shani focused on learning Togo Atsia, which is a dance performed exclusively by women in Ghana. And she's going to here to tell us more about her work with Professor Gideon and Togo Atsia. Welcome, Shani. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much uh, to Texas Folk Life. I think this is a wonderful opportunity and very unique to allow artists this time and space to learn in this capacity. So I just want to say a big Thank you, note of appreciation. Um, I want to just kind of touch on some of the things that he mentioned and just kind of say why, how I arrived at this place. I think it's very important uh, because this experience is closely related to my current research. And as a dancer, combining the movement with the academic side of it is very interesting uh, to negotiate that space. So I just want to say a bit about, um, he mentioned that I'm a professor at Houston Community College. Um, in 2002, I was first uh, exposed to Ghanaian dance at Jacob's Pillow, uh, which was the cultural traditions program, uh, tribute to Miss Catherine Dunham, and she was there. So um, there was also Dr. Reginald Yates and many students from the University of Ghana. This was my first time experiencing Ghanaian dance and so many seeds were planted. I'm sure you, I'm sure you can imagine with Professor, uh, Dr. Reginald Gates, um, Miss Catherine Dunham, um, there, it was such fertile ground. So um, in 2005, after I finished my MFA at Florida State, I did a Fulbright in Ghana, West Africa. At that time, I had so many questions after having studied dance um, basically my entire life through schools, colleges, uh, studying mostly ballet, modern, tap, jazz, which uh, at that time, that's what a typical dance program encompassed. Uh, from time to time, I would have a West African dance. And then of course, I would see what we might call black dance <laughs> in the church or um, at my family get togethers. So I began to develop questions uh, specifically about West African dance or Ghanaian dance or dance from West Africa. You know, um, what happens as these dances travel, as these dances travel from the village, from the specific ethnic group that does the dance, the tribe or ethnic group, as these dances travel, to the stage, to the university there in Ghana, subsequently to the US or England, wherever those dances go, what changes and what causes those changes? What factors contribute to those changes? So at that time, I looked at dance in the village. I looked at dance in amateur and professional performance groups. And I also looked at dance at the University of Ghana. And I walked away with three words <laughs> after a year. Lifestyle breeds technique. The way you live determines the way you move. So um, there was, of course, so many other factors. 
Do the instruments affect that? Are you using the actual instruments that are associated with those dances? Each dance or tribe may have specific instruments, specific ways of dressing, specific foods. Um, so all of this became very real for me um, to contribute to my questions. Um, another thing that I noticed in Ghana is the religion. Uh, you had Christianity, you had the traditional practices, and you had Islam, all coexisting amicably. Amicably, you know, there was no issue with how there was no fighting. And that was very interesting to me how they coexisted and the dances didn't really change, you know. So I began to have other questions um, and looking at religion in Africa, religion in the black community. Uh, so that brings me to my current interest and in, in how I'm here at this place. I'm currently a student doing a second master's degree, an MA degree in religious studies at Rice University. So I'm focusing on um, African religion and African-American religion, which is, those are so, such broad topics, but I'm specifically interested in the intersection, how they intersect, you know, in the transition from Africa to America, you know, what happened with the religion and how does that affect the dance? What role does dance play in that process. So I'm interested um, in a specific dance called the Ring Shout, um, which of course is a dance that was performed um, by the Africans that were enslaved. It's a dance that exists in a counterclockwise circle and it is the predecessor to the shout. The shout is a dance that we see in black churches today. I'm interested in the aesthetics of the dance. Uh, Barbara Glass in her book, uh, African American Dance, she talks about certain aesthetics. Some of those are orientation to the earth. The movement is grounded, right? Another one is polyrhythm. You have different rhythms that are layered, which you'll hear later when I play the music for Togo Achia. You have importance of community, right? So within these dances, the community is very important as opposed to the separation between performer and audience. So all of these things became uh, universal through lines for me to that I could see in these dances, um, irregardless of the religion um, or the setting. Right. So um, I guess I will talk a little bit about um, my process. So I'm in the process of, process of interrogating certain texts. One of them is uh, scenes of Scenes of Subjection by Sadia Hartman, and then also um, interviewing different people. And then um, one of the other things that I'm doing is working with Professor Gideon. <laughs> uh, I wanna look at how dance exists in West Africa, which I have a long experience with, but what I can say about Togo Achia is, um, when I first saw this dance, I could see that it's not a dance that you learn very quickly. <laughs> Some dances you can learn um, fairly quickly, um, but I will say most dances take a lot of time is why I've stayed with Ghanaian dance. If you focus on the drumming, the historical and cultural uh, references to the dance, but Togo Achia is very unique. Um, it's a, it's a very uh, difficult dance to learn. And um, the drumming is also something that's um, very difficult. So I wanna talk a little bit about uh, Professor Gideon. So <laughs> working with Professor Gideon is a very interesting experience. Um, of course, he is my elder. He is a, a rarity in American academia. Most professors have to have a PhD you know, but Professor uh, Professor Gideon's experience is it, it is equivalent to that, as surpasses that, <laughs> and uh, that's one of the things that I'm interested in. Also, how do we how do we measure these um, cultural dances and songs and 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 uh, musical patterns, drumming patterns by a PhD? when they're not taught in this way 
in the countries that they're from. So um, I'm very glad that Professor Gideon exists, that he has his position at the um, University of North Texas in Denton. Um, he is passing on traditions that are um, in danger of disappearing in some environments. Um, he combines the dance, the music, and the spirituality. And um, he's just an amazing person to work with. Um, I wanted to work with him for so many years. So I'm very grateful for Texas Folk Life and this capacity to work with him. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, the dance. So I wanna start with the musical instruments. <laughs> um, each of these dances can exist as communication. So it's not just dance for entertainment purposes. The dances have social functions in many instances. And I want to talk a bit about this instrument. This is the uh, Achimibu, Achimibu drum. This is the master drum for Togo Acha, and it's typically on a stand. But I just wanted to show it, and I hope you can see this. This drum is very tall, <laughs> so it comes to here, and um, it's usually on a stand. But I want to talk about the symbols on the drum. So this symbol is Jinyami. The symbol is Jinyami. And this symbol means accept God. Um, that God is the greatest. God is all seeing and all knowing. It's what this actual symbol means, Jinyami. So in other words, this is like a prayer. It's like a prayer and like a, a praise just the symbol on the drum. It's like a way of communicating. And this other symbol, this one is called Sankofa. So this uh, Sankofa is a very popular uh, Adinkra symbol. These are called Adinkra symbols and they are from the Akan of Ghana, West Africa. Sankofa can be shown as a bird with the feet facing forward and the head facing back like the bird is going to retrieve an egg that she dropped, or it can be this heart. And Sankofa literally means it's not wrong to go back for that which you have forgotten. So if you make a mistake, or if you go back to learn your culture, um, it can have so many different meanings. So you can see even through the drumming, the visual aspect of the drumming can be a communication and a prayer. Not even to talk about the rhythms, which are associated with the languages. So I just wanted to share that little bit about um, the Achimivu drum of Togo Achia. Uh, also, I just want to say that Togo Achia uh, refers to the music of the Ewe people of Ghana and the Republic of Togo. It's a recreational dance. Uh, performed mostly by women, as he said earlier. Um, but it's also what Professor, Professor Gideon shared to me is through the dance, there's a lot of communication that happens. So if you're wanting to say something, people that are watching the performance, of course, they have knowledge of this. So you can say it through the dance. All right. So now I would like to um, just show the video uh, that I have, which is a part of the rehearsal that we had. So if you can go to the video, please, I'm gonna. We spent a lot of time on the drumming because it's very important. And then now you can see me working on Togo Acha, which uses these props.
And Professor Gideon did dance with me. <laughs> So just a word about that. Um, of course, I traveled to um, Denton to work with him and coronavirus put a, a stop in, in that. Um, these videos that I'm sharing are from the rehearsal rehearsals that we had. I didn't anticipate um, anybody else seeing them but myself. But you can see my children are a part of the process, which emphasizes the importance of community. There's never been a, a time that I went to Ghana or invited an artist for the Aquaba Festival that they didn't bring everyone into the process. If you're sitting down, you can try and play the Chekere or, or you can learn the song. So everyone is a part of the process. And in learning the dance, I shared those photos of the musical instruments just to show you that for me to learn the dance, I had to sit with the music for a while. You know, and, and still, even the music that you heard is not all of the, the rhythms. <laughs> There's so many rhythms, which goes back to um, it being polyrhythmical. So um, for me, looking at how West African dance exists, what are the aesthetics, and then learning about how trauma can affect performance is giving me insight into the shout. So this is a part of my academic process. And this is why um, it was so important for me to spend time with Professor Gideon, who um, is a rarity and who um, has learned all of these instruments, dances and drumming, not necessarily in a university environment, which is not how we always learn uh, these dances, not how the dances are learned in West Africa. As a professor, I'm trying to bring in those elements to my classes uh, to, to try and um, honor that way of learning. So now I would like to show you this, which is the horsetail. And this is the prop that is used in Togo Achia, the horsetail here. So I'm just gonna show you a little bit of the movement move this achimebu, which is very heavy. I'm gonna show you a little bit of the movement so you can see it's very much uh, associated with the back, right? A lot of Ghanaian dance uses the back, right? And then you have to be able to use, you have to be able to use the horse tail. So um, it's kind of like one of those feelings where you're patting your head and rubbing your stomach. I'm gonna put the music on and then I am going to do the dance, do some of the dance for you. I hope you guys can hear it. So the polyrhythm is in the body also.
Yeah, so <laughs> let me stop it. All right, so just to show you, that's just to show you the basic movement for Togo Achia. And typically, uh, that would not be performed to uh, recording. Uh, the drummers would be there, and it's a language between the drummer and the dancer. The drummer tells you when to move to the next movement. So uh, you can see that there's a lot of movement of the torso, movement of the horse tail, and then you're playing the different rhythms in your body. So your feet are associated with the bell. Ba, 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 ba. Right? And then your arms are with a different rhythm and your torso. <laughs> so it's a lot to manage and a lot to learn. Um, I'll be sitting with Togo Achia for a while. <laughs> yeah, I don't, as a researcher and a professor and a scholar, I don't believe that you always have to rush and, and feel that you um, have learned something in a short time. So I want more time with it. I plan on spending more time with it uh, to learn more. So that's it. Uh, you want to ask a question? I see a question there. <laughs> yes, Shani, thank you um, so much for that very in-depth uh, presentation. That was wonderful. And I, as somebody who um, does research about music from South of, the, South of the Sahara, I have tons of questions, but I'm going to contain myself um, and uh, ask a question from one of the viewers. So here's a question from Kate Murray. Um, she asks, you mentioned that the dance is um, one that is traditionally performed just by women and that each dance has an intention or purpose. Can you elaborate on the meaning and intention of the dance and why women are the usual performers of it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what I got from Professor Gideon is it's mostly women and the men are primarily drumming. And um, also that it, it shows a style, the style of dancing in, to in Togo. So I believe that the style is, a, is to show the beauty of women because I've also read that Togo Achia can be a romantic dance. Hmm. So um, one of the things that I learned as a Fulbrighter in studying certain dances in Ghana is that sometimes you get different um, meanings for different <laughs> dances, you know, um, but from what I can tell you with my time with Togo Achia is that it is a dance that shows your style. And that style is, I'm guessing, a feminine style. Mm. Um, also that it is a romantic dance. So in that exchange, and some dances, the, the women are primarily the dancers and the men are the drummers. So um, I've seen some female drummers, but not a lot. <laughs> So you also have gender roles, like historical gender roles in this in this environment. And um, I think that plays a part of it also. But like I said, my time with Professor Gideon, I had two weekends with him. And um, I definitely plan on spending more time with the dance um, to get in a more in-depth meaning. Mm -hmm. I hope that helps. <laughs> For sure. And I think maybe you could comment on this too a little bit. Um, and I think you presented it um, wonderfully when you were showing the drum and the symbols and the carvings on the drum itself, they are that they themselves are carrying their own meaning. Yeah. Rhythms that are being played are carrying their own meaning in some way, the dance, um, the specific kinetic movements. Um, so it's just, a, it's this multi-layered um, uh, sign in a way, right? It's, it's, there's many, many layers of meaning um, all happening kind of simultaneously. Exactly. Exactly. And the beautiful thing about that is the audience, typically the audience will have knowledge of all those different layered ways of communicating. We don't just look at communicating communication as verbal or interpretive or through the 
music, but communication happens, of, of course, with the body language, but also, like you said, with the, the meaning, the adinkra symbols, which are signs that have certain things that they communicate on the drums. You can also know the where the drums are from by looking at them or what tribe or ethnic group it's associated with. So there's so many layered ways of communicating through the dance. Mm. Um, that's wonderful. Um, Johnny, thank you again. I look forward to a time where I can head over to Houston and check out your, your festival in person. Um, mm -hmm. I look forward to that. Um, so uh, thank you all for joining tonight. I just wanna give one final thank you to each of the artists uh, who presented this evening. I thought it was a fantastic show. Um, and again, I've really enjoyed getting to know um, all of the, the members, all the participants in the apprenticeship program over the course of the past few months um, and learning about all the dynamic and exciting work happening all over the state. Um, I wanna give a quick shout out to Ben Doyle of Band Productions for his technical, uh, technical assistance running tonight's show behind the scenes. And again, thank you all um, who joined and are watching um, through Facebook. Uh, please be sure to tune in again next Tuesday. You know, the fun is not over with. We have a lot more where tonight came from. So next Tuesday, August 18th, um, we'll be showing part two of the Apprenticeships in the Folk Arts Virtual Showcase, which will again be streaming live on Texas Folk Life's page at 6 p.m. Uh, part two will feature presentations on hand weaving, quilting, and South Indian Carnatic music. Thank you again. Uh, have a great evening and stay safe.